Welcome to Tanakh Talk. Please tell us your name and where you're coming from. Yes, hi. Um, this is Beth from St. Louis. Hi, Beth. How are you? Welcome to Texas and in Jakarta. <laughs> What's the question thank for Rabbi? You, thank you. Sure. Um, I have a question for the Rabbi um, about God's standard of righteousness according to the story of, of Adam and Eve, okay? Okay. And um, in, in the story of Adam and Eve, they, you know, ate the apple and they were immediately kicked out of the Garden of Eden. And Christians are kicked out of heaven, kicked out of everything. And Christians are taught that, you know, that's it. Once you sin, you cannot be righteous ever. You can't ask God to forgive you. You can't repent. You're going straight to hell. Um, That's a great how question. How in Judaism do you... Okay, thank you, thank you. And mm -hmm. so I would like the rabbi's interpretation of the story of Adam and Eve and what is God's standard of righteousness. Does he expect us to be perfect, and does he expect us to never sin? That is just... Wonderfully, wonderfully juicy. I love the way you put that, and I cannot wait to hear what Rabbi's got to say about it. Beth, thank you so much for calling in. Let's hang up, and you can tune in for your answer, and that'll free open the phone lines, okay? Uh, awesome. Thank you both. Bye-bye. Perfect. Thank you. Man, that's, that's really... I love the way she put it, too, because that right there, if that's not true, then... It, then Christianity just will fall apart, just just on that basis alone. I mean, if 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 God, I mean, if there is another answer besides you sin, you die. You know, the world needs to know about it. Rabbi, what do you got? We find that um, that Adam and Eve, after they ate from the from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, the, the apple part <laughs> comes from uh, the paintings, not from the Bible. And believe me, the or it comes from the movies, and the book is better than the movie. But uh, the point is that, in fact, after uh, Adam and Eve were, after they were, they sinned. And it, it, you notice the very intriguing conversation that we find in uh, Genesis 2 and 3, where God is, like, asking, like, where are you? And what you know? I, I notice that you you see that you're naked, and that plays a very big role there. And given that you see that, you must have eaten from the tree of the forbidden tree of knowledge of good and evil. What happens then is the very opposite. Meaning, we see in Genesis chapter three, in Christian terms, man is then separated um, from God completely after he leaves the Garden of Eden. And in fact, angels, seraphim, are posted in Genesis 3.22 before the Garden of Eden so that no man ever returns there lest to eat from the tree of life and live and be like one of us and live forever. Um, but if you look at the what God tells Adam and Eve, it really, everything then becomes very obvious. Now, first, let's take, it's important for us to un examine the Christian claim. The Christian claim, based on the, on the New Testament, is that Jesus came to repair the sin of Adam. He's therefore widely understood to be the second Adam, who repaired the sin, or what is called the original sin, capital O, capital S. Of course, this is a very striking claim because, as it turns out, uh, as it turns out, the Bible says, because you have eaten from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, um, uh, women will give birth, labor, and, and conceive in with great difficulty and give birth in great difficulty, man will, by the sweat of his brow, will have to work the earth. Now, if Jesus repaired that, which means Jesus is the second Adam, and therefore he undid that, that's the Christian claim, then that is, with, if, if Christians claim that in fact the Messiah is to 
undo the sin, the original sin in the Garden of Eden, isn't it interesting that to this day, women still have difficulty in conceiving and labor greatly in, in the delivery room, in the birthing room. And men still work very hard to grow anything from the ground. So if Jesus, it means let's for a moment concede everything. That the Messiah is supposed to repair and undo the events of, that occurred in the Garden of Eden, the catastrophic event. That's what we're told. That's what Augustine told us. We're told that all over in the Christian Bible. Paul speaks about this. If that's the case, then there's a very big question. That proves that Jesus can't be the Messiah. That means there can be then no greater proof that Jesus is not the Messiah. Why? Because he failed at that task. As it turns out, women still give birth in pain. Men still till the soil in order to grow anything. And all this, what we're told by Christ, where the church is, we're told that, but it, we're saved in something that we can't see. And that is, the Christians are saved from hell saved from damnation, saved from original sin, saved from our sinful nature, Romans 3, because no one wants the truth, no one wants the gospel. It's a misquote of Psalm 14, but the key point is that what Christianity is saying is that it has, Jesus has only healed or addressed the one thing that we can't tell. I mean, how do you know that Jesus actually saves you from sin? I mean, what are you going to do? Take a shovel from Home Depot and go to a cemetery and dig up a body and say, hey, buddy, what happened? You can't check it out. But if Jesus really did repair the sin in the Garden of Eden, then women should give, conceive and give birth in ease, and men should just have to do nothing for, for plants to grow. So we see there clearly that if Jesus is supposed to have repaired that, means that Jesus' function is the being the second Adam, and to undo, to reverse the error of Adam. And incidentally, it's people, you know, it, Christians have the same difficulty in giving birth and tilling the soil. And even we see, you know, Paul describes having to go somewhere, but he says, Satan hindered us. Well, Satan is alive and well, and nothing was accomplished that is verifiable. Now, compare that to the Torah. When the God of Israel speaks, he says repeatedly, the refrain, the maxim in Scripture is, Zahar, remember, remember. Why? God doesn't, imagine you go to a bank and you want to get a loan. Now, let me tell you this, if you don't know this, banks make money by giving out loans. No one borrowed money from the bank. You put money in the bank, and what do you get? 1%, 2%, I don't know what you get, 1.5%? If you just put in a savings account, you get nothing practically, right? But let's say you want to go buy a house. I have no idea what the rate is. I'm just going to make up it's 6%. So if, you're, if the bank is acquiring money, paying 1%, and loaning at 6%, <laughs> they're making a fortune. That's why they have such fancy buildings. So, so a bank wants to loan money. It's very important to them. But let's say you go into a bank and you say, I want to borrow, you know, $500,000 for I need capital for a business or whatever it is. Or you want a completely unsecured loan, you'd like a credit card, right? So what's the first question the bank is going to ask you? Any bank. It doesn't make a difference where you are. It doesn't make a difference what country you're in, what state you're in. It makes no difference what you look like. One thing they want to know is, they want to know first is, what is your record? What is your credit history? In the past, what have you done? The banks will want to say, give me your social security number. We want to look up and to see what is your credit rating, meaning in the past, how have you handled debts? They want to see something verified. But let's say you turn to the bank manager, whatever, and you say, look, you don't need to look up. You don't need my social security number. I promise you, don't look. Don't look at the past. Don't look at anything that's verifiable, that's testable. No, 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 don't do that. Just believe me, trust me, uh, and that I'll pay back. So, so the bank would say, I'm sorry, we need to look. We said, 
Don't look. You can't, I can't give you my social security number. <laughs> you have to trust me. So the bank will say, look, you see that door? <laughs> have a nice day, buddy. And they'll go out there. Why? Because no one, everybody, every, any bank, any, any, the way they know is not on a promise of the future. You're going to go to heaven. You're going to go to hell. I'm going to repay my loan. What the bank is going to want to see is, let me see what you've done in the past. That's a very big difference. And that's what the tyrant does. The tyrant doesn't say you're going to go to heaven or hell. doesn't mean there isn't heaven or hell. There is. But the tyrant doesn't threaten us with it. Why? Because it's unverifiable. You can't test it. None of us have been on the other side. So when the tyrant speaks, it says these delicious words that you want to just drink. It says, Sha'alna l'yamim yishaynim. Think back to time, earlier times, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 32. Zechor Yemay Salam. Look back in all of history. Ask yourself from every generation, every generation, has anything like this ever occurred? And the Torah then also says, this is what's going to happen to you. You're going to go into the promised land. It tells you you're going to go into the promised land, not necessarily because of your merit, Deuteronomy chapter 7, but I made a promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob of blessed memory, and it's through their merit that you're going to go into the land. But if you turn against me, you turn away, I'll throw you out of the land. And, and, he, and he did. He, so it's not like all good stuff, like we'd like to believe. No, Tanakh is full of very, very harsh criticism of the Jewish people constantly. It's, it's often been said that the Jewish Bible was either written by God or an anti-Semite, in the sense that there's so much criticism. And then the prophet said, you could have been exiled for 70 years. And an earlier prophet, Isaiah, blessed memory, said 150 years before the fact, he said that Cyrus, the king of Persia, who never even existed, is going to be the one to tell you to go back. And not only that, early on in, in Isaiah 14, Isaiah is talking about the Babylonian Empire <laughs> and its fall. That would be like writing in the 1700s about the Soviet Union, but that it's going to collapse. <laughs> and then the Tyrus says, that, that I, Jeremiah says, that, that after, after, after 70 years, you're going to return back to this place. Read Jeremiah 29. 10. And then the Bible, Daniel tells us that the Jews are going to be back. But the whole, you're going to be thrown, the temple's going to be destroyed after 490 years from the first temple. So it's not good news, but the Tyrus is everything. And Jeremiah 30, verse 7 tells us about Jacob's trouble, but be men from it, Yivoshea, from the greatest trauma to the Jewish people, will come your salvation. And then there's an explosion of ecstatic, of ecstatic messianic prophecy. We saw it before our eyes. So therefore, look at the difference. The Torah says, God says, test me. Here, here's, here's my credit rating. Here's my past. Test me. Christianity does make fantastic promises. But this promise is saying, I'll pay you back. It's, you can't look back and say that anyone's saved. No one could look back. There's nothing that can be tested. It's all about trust me in the future. Not only Christianity, Hinduism will tell you you're going to come back again. And all these religions, and Sai Baba, the, the, the guru from India, said all these things. And it's all nothing. So the kid's the key point. So it's nonsensical. If Christians want to say that the Mashiach is supposed to be a second Adam, and repair the uh, repair the error of Adam and Eve, and that we are all condemned as a result. But now we're redeemed. So why is it that all those things that would have been verifiable, namely that women give birth in in difficulties, and why are all those things haven't they been reversed? Ah, so it's all sheker v'chazaf. It's all. It's not true. <laughs> it's just uh, it isn't ain't true. Now let's get back to what Scripture says. If it is true, what the church is claiming that as a result of the sin of Adam and Eve, as a result of that uh, of that event, man is sinful by nature and therefore could do nothing to be righteous in God's eyes. And they, that is a central claim. And believe me, if you never heard of that in your life. That means that you have been, <laughs> you're a Lubavitcher. That means you've never been to church in your life. Because, believe me, I ain't making this up. Most of my, most of the views of the show, I think, I didn't do a survey, are either Christians or former Christians. I think. I'm not sure, but there's no way I can make any of this up. Christians say that there's nothing that man can do to be righteous in the eyes of God. But we, the question is, 
does this in any way comport what we find in Scripture? And so, of course not. We find in Genesis 26, verse 5, very specifically that Avram, Avinu, Abraham, our father, uh, Abraham, our father, kept all of God's commands, and he was righteous completely. We have other great kings. Yotam was a great king, and Scripture says explicitly that he kept all of God's commands. We have so many people in the Bible, Kalev and so on, that were completely a sneel ben Kanas, and so many people the Bible says that were righteous, and even those who sinned, like King David, when he said in in first in Second Samuel chapter twelve verse thirteen, after he was confronted with a sin that's really amazing, stunning, he said Chatasi Lashem, two delicious words, two holy words, Chatasi Lashem, which means I have sinned before God. And the Almighty saw his heart, he knew it was sincere, and he's, the prophet Nathan, who had rebuked him using a parable unbeknownst to David, said, the Lord has already forgiven you. So, number one, there are righteous people throughout the Jewish scriptures. Job, in the book of Job, every Christian should burn, because Job is an impossibility. Job, Jesus in the Bible says that Job ultimately never cursed God. He cursed the womb to, that he was conceived in because of what he endured as he was tested, as his faith was tested, but he didn't listen to his friends, his companions. So therefore, the claims of the church are not true. Moreover, another point, we see clearly, we see clearly that God lays out for us that we can master over Satan, if, over sin. If you look at immediately at the sin of Adam and Eve, so I'm really right in context. There we have Genesis chapter 3. You go to Genesis chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. Please look it up for yourself. What does it say there? It says that sin is hiding behind the door, which means sin doesn't come and go, oh, go rob a bank, go rape who No, it knows everybody has a certain weakness, and we all have our own weaknesses, and therefore the, sudden, the, the sin is hiding behind the door. You are the object of his desire, but you can, you can, um, you can overcome him. So therefore, the teachings of the church that man is sinful by nature, meaning does not mean that man doesn't have a desire to sin. He does, but he has both, and he could choose either way. Scripture tells us that explicitly in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 14, 15, 16, 17. What does it say? Actually, you could back up a few verses. You can go back to Deuteronomy 30, verse 10. Please look it up. The Torah says, don't say these kinds of things. You know what the Torah says? The Torah says, don't say the Torah, the commandments, the law is too hard for you, it's too far off, it's over the sea, who will bring it to us, who will bring us to keep it, Ay, it's up in heaven, who will bring it down to us that we may do it. And look at verse 14, the law is near to you, it's in your heart that you may do it. And I ask you this, if you have a Christian Bible, you wouldn't believe this. If you have a Christian Bible, you have to look it up, you won't believe me. It says there openly that you can do it. This is Deuteronomy. This is Deuteronomy. That means this is 2,488 years after the sin of Adam and Eve, right? It's after the fact, very after. So wh what does it say there? It says there that you can keep the Torah, that you can keep the Lord. Don't say it's not hard. Now, this is a big problem. You think Paul likes this? Paul despises this passage. So what does Paul do? Please go to Romans chapter 10, verse 6 through 8. And in case you're not sure, don't, please don't try, look at the footnotes in your Christian Bible. It will tell you, it will cross-reference these passages. And then Paul will take, these are harsh words, my friends, but you didn't come to watch this. These, you can go watch reruns of the Ed Sullivan Show. You're watching this because you want it straight. So I'm going to give it to you straight. What does Paul say? He says, who'll go off of us, that Christ will bring it down to us. He rips it into pieces. And then he, look at this. He says, the law is near to you in your heart. Read it. But the critical words is that you can do it. That you can do it. Look it up in Romans 10, verse 6 and 8. He literally takes out a scissor, a scalpel, and he cuts out the words that you may do it. You know why? 
Because the words you may do it is an offense to the church. It's an offense to his Christology. Paul just spent how many chapters saying, he just spent all the way the whole Roman saying that no one could do it. So what does he do? He cuts out the word of God. Now, if you're going to go to my Bible, to the Holy Torah HaKadoshah, the Torah of Moses, our teacher, and you're going to, you're going to manipulate, you're going to alter, you're going to tamper, you're going to surgically remove passages that the Lord of Lords, host of hosts gave us, you think I'm going to convert to Christian? Christianity. You think I'm going to get baptized? You think you think I'm going to go to a church? Have you lost your mind? I'm going to leave skid marks. I'm gone. I'm out of here. Let me be very clear. Jews don't. It's not that personal things were against Yeshua. The scales of her eyes and her hearts. Nonsense. That's that's that. Paul makes that case in the letters to the to the Corinthians to to the churches in Corinth. That the church in Corinth. That's Paul. That's nonsense. But how dare Paul change the word of God? And I say this to people. I'm not a Christian. I'm just pro-God. And if I say this, and I'm not the spokesman for the Jewish people. I'm really not. I should be, but I'm not. But I, I, I will tell you straight away. If any Jew, if we have to choose between Moses and Paul, if that's what we have to choose, we are going with Moses every time. You understand? So it's not like, oh, you reject G- Jesus. When I say Jesus, I'm talking to the Christian Jesus, okay? I'm not talking to the guy who plays shortstop for the Yankees. I'm talking about the Christological Jesus, not the Jesus of Islam. That's a totally different ball game. But if you're asking us, we have to choose Paul, show Paul, change the word of God. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2 says, you may not add to the Lord, nor take away from it. So how did Paul take away? And if he does take away from it, he is in rebellion against the God of Israel. So therefore, the, now I want to want to point Th- this now. Now that I've set, now that you've all seen this point, now I have to show you why did God? Is a very interesting thing. What does giving birth in difficulty, conceiving in great difficulty, and getting food from the ground with difficulty? What is that? How does that have anything to do with the sin in the Garden of Eden? That means, what what is the relationship between the two? You see, like, why didn't he say, uh, I'm going to bang you over the head three times a day? (laughs) What I'm going to do is, I'm going to play, like, um, I'm going to play jazz. I'm going to play opera music in your ear ear every day. (laughs) It's the torture, whatever it is. Why didn't he, what, what, what is, what? In God's earth, does a woman having difficulty conceiving and giving birth, and a man having difficulty in bringing food from the ground, what does that have to do with the knowledge of good and evil? What is the relationship between the two? If you don't know the answer to that question, you should not go home, but you're, you totally have no idea. It's just the opposite. And why, by the way, look at the serpent. His is that everything you'll eat will be like dust. Okay, does this make any sense to anybody? I mean, serpent, everything will be dust. That's a problem. That's the biggest blessing in the world. That means the serpent, if everything is dust, he'll eat. That means food is accessible everywhere. The serpent is doing great. The guy who, whatever the serpent is, we're not going to go there now. It's not germane directly to this question. But believe me, that's a that's winning the lottery. Because normally I have to go shopping and I have to go buy and I have to earn money to buy. A serpent never goes hungry, always. So how is that a punishment? That's the biggest blessing. And he started the whole thing. And Adam and Eve, what is that? So let's now make sense. If this doesn't, if you read the Holy Torah, and every letter is the delicious word of Hashem, and something doesn't jive, it doesn't make sense, you have to say, oh, oh Lord, please give me wisdom. Shema b'ni. Listen, my son, listen, children of God. Listen to those who are born from above and not from below. The whole purpose that the serpent, whatever it is, I'm not going to get into its nature, is, but clearly it's representing something evil. The purpose of the snake that everything will dust he'll eat is exactly that. The serpent will never need God, will never need a relationship with God. Why? Because everything is accessible. Food is everywhere. Whereas Adam and Eve, they 
when they want to have babies, when they want to eat food, they're forced into a relationship with God. Now, a woman, in order for her to conceive, now she has to pray to Hashem. It doesn't just, babies don't just pop out. Babies, women don't just conceive easily. So now, millions and billions of women around the world, as we're speaking now, are praying, oh, Hashem, Lord, would it be that I would have a baby? So what, these are not curses, really, you'll say, but it says curse, but the Hebrew word, you have to know the Hebrew, there are two words for a curse. Hebrew is a very tiny language. Tiny, tiny, tiny. It means a very small lexicon. And there actually is two words for curse. How could a language be so small? Biblical Hebrew is very tiny and is therefore extremely precise. You, there, so why would you have two words? There is a reason. The word is aurur. Aurur also means light. The way God brings light to Adam and Eve, how does God restore what has happened is the following. I'm going to make sure that you're going to really, by the sweat of your brow, are going to need food, which means I'm going to force you into a relationship with me. If you want food to grow out of the ground, if you want to harvest, you're going to have to call out to me. That means I'm forcing you to have a relationship. Exactly the opposite of the claim of Christianity. Not only didn't the sin that took place in the Garden of Eden cut off, uh, d- d- not only did it not uh, uh, create a, 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 an insurmountable gap between two, just the opposite. It forces men and women now into a relationship with God. Now we need to be closer than ever. Now you're going to have to come to me for babies. Now you have to come for me for food. The serpent, I don't want. You can go eat dust. It means eat dust. The serpent will never need God. So it's literally the exact opposite. It's a, you see how good Tyre is? You see how good, delicious, how every word. But I say to you, Kindlech, you're reading Tyre. You're reading the word of Hashem. Every letter is there is comes from God. Every word comes, everything that was created comes from the breath of God, Psalm 33, verse 6. If you come to a passage and there's an anomaly, something you find very striking, something that you're going, well, what's going on here? Stop, drill, discovery, oil, gold, diamonds. Oh, how wonderful is your Torah. How delicious is your Torah. Those are not my words. Read Psalm 119 and be healed and be saved. And may it be that our love for Tyre and the continue to study Tyre will bring the true Mashiach from Hebrew to time. <laughs> אזי מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי כפלות הכל לבדו ימלוך נורא והוא היה והוא עובד והוא עובד והוא יהיה בתפארה אדון עולם אשר מלך בטרם כל יציא נברא לעת נסע וחפצה כל הזי מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי ככלות הכל לבדו ימלוך נורא והוא היה והוא עובר והוא יהיה בתפארה אדון עולם אשר מלך בטרם כל יציא נברא לעת נסע וחפצה כל הזי מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי ככלות הכל לבדו ימלוך נורא והוא היה והוא עובר בתפארה והוא עובר והוא יהיה בתפארה אדון עולם אשר מלך בטרם כל יציר נברא לעת עשה וחפצו כל עשה עם מלך, עשה עם מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי ככלות הכל לבדו ימלוך נורא והוא היה והוא עובד והוא עובד והוא יהיה בתפארה אדון עולם השם הלך בטרם כל יציר נברא לעת נסע בחצר כל הזי מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי כפלות הכל לבדו עם אף נורא והוא היה והוא עובד והוא יהיה בתפארה אדון עולם השם הלך בטרם כל יציר נברא לעת נסע בחצר כל הזי מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי כפלות הכל לבדו עם אף נורא והוא היה והוא עובד בתפארה והוא עובד והוא יהיה בתפארה Let's
אותו קול. אזי מלך, אזי מלך, שמו נקרא. אדון עולם, השם הלך, בטרם כל יצי נברא לעת נשא בחפצה כל הזי מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי ככלות הכל לבדו עם נוח נורא והוא היה והוא הווה והוא יהיה בתפארה אדון עולם, השם הלך, בטרם כל יצי נברא לעת נשא בחפצה כל הזי מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי ככלות הכל לבדו עם נוח נורא והוא היה והוא הווה בתפארה והוא הווה והוא יהיה בתפארה והוא היה והוא הווה בתפארה והוא הווה והוא יהיה בתפארה 